we'll move on to Oye. So it's my pleasure to announce our second speaker, also from Nigeria, Oye. Oye is a web enthusiast who is curious about building for the web and is currently a lead front end architect. He's in love with learning advanced concepts for building scalable applications and sharing this knowledge. So take it Thank away. You, sure. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So let me just uh, share my screen real quick. Let me know when you can see my screen. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So today I will be talking about dynamic component architecture. But before I move forward, just a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Oyemadi Oyemaja, but you can call me Oye I'm from Nigeria. I'm a web enthusiast. And I'm curious about building for the web, like Julie mentioned. I work as a lean fronted architect here in Nigeria. Um, so before I go any further, uh, I would like to say a big thank you to Bonnie Brainan for sharing her dynamic forms project with us in our Angular Architect training and Angular Nation. It's a major source of inspiration behind this content I'm about to share with you guys today. Uh, just a quick info, uh, Bonnie Brennan is an Angular GDE and the founder of Angular Network, uh, Angular Nation Network. Uh, it's a free private network created for Angular developers and that's where we've been nerding out for a while now. So everyone is welcome to join. Uh, so, after going through Bonnie's um, presentation, um, the dynamic form presentation I mentioned earlier, I was really fascinated by it because basically what she did was she took the whole abstraction of having to create your whole initializations of your form controls and your, you and you're using reactive forms and then just automated that whole process. And you have a situation where you have a dynamic component that automatically just renders your forms for you and you get your values. So I was really fascinated by um, this kind of architecture and after learning that, I decided that there were more places in my organization that needed this kind of functionality and that could really benefit from it. For in a, an example for us was probably our tables. Um, being a fintech company that I work with, we have quite a lot of tables for showing things like clients, you know, um, different data that was usually on a grid. And we had the same particular type of code, just normal table markup in different places, different developers, in, Different, um, implementing the same functionality over and over again, just, um, I wouldn't say wasting time, but doing the same thing over and over again when we could actually be doing more with less. So I saw this as an opportunity to actually create that um, functionality. But the problem was that being able to modularize, you know, your standard TH, your standard CD components, but anyway, we'll go through everything and. It's fascinating how I was able to work on it. Um, so after uh, working on a custom version for my company, we created a design system and I was able to create a dynamic table component that works throughout our application. So it's kind of like having your own, I don't know many who people are familiar with things like Kendo UI or AG Grid, but we didn't need all the function, additional functionalities that came with those. Um, we were able to create something that was just worked for our own use case. And it was really fascinating. So um, advantages also of having dynamic functionality is the fact that you can cater for your specific use cases, write less code, obviously, and then the modularity, the fact that if we needed to make a change on every table, we just needed to make that change in one place and everybody was set it out was a major, major advantage for us. Um, so it's also important to note that um, the main point I'm trying to pass is just the thought behind the process and that the demo I'm showing today was majorly used, built to fit my organization's use case. But yeah, there's a lot that can be learned and a lot that can be taken out of this to be able to then accommodate different use cases as whoever is working on it on its sys fit. Uh, so today I'll be working on, uh, I'll just be showing us two components. So apart from the table components, um, we also created a modal component too that is also dynamic. So basically for everybody using a model, you just instantiate the component and you pass in the data you want and you're good to go. So today I will be sharing that with you guys. So let's hope it goes well. Uh, so can you see my VS code? Yeah, okay. Okay. So here um, I have a standard uh, in Angular application that was created with the 
Angular CLI. And I already created um, a couple of modules that represent um, each topic that we're going to represent today. And for the dynamic table, so just showing you what it looks like on the UI, let's just assume this is a standard table we had in my organization, standard table, and then we had a button, probably an action performing something. In this case, we're just showing probably the customer's name that was clicked, the amount spent and the email address and stuff like that. So usually if you want to do something like that in my, comp in my company previously, or when you're even using tables in general, you would have to instantiate your table element with HTML, your T head, your TR, and then the headers that you want to use for your components. And then you get your data, be it where you are using um, the async pipe to get it reactively, or you are using, uh, let me just show the TS file so that we can pull along. Yeah, so just an array of customers. And then we are looping through the array and then showing them on the table, uh, standard stuff, nothing to be fancy. And then for the button here, we have a click handler, click event handler here that calls a particular function from our template. And then the function does files and action and then so this was how we were doing it. And imagine having this. So I have two different tables here with basically the same format. And this is just a mini table. We have tables with larger rows, tables that had other things to them. And having to do this over and over again, instantiating the writing these elements, I felt was a little bit redundant. So basically, this is what we have now. Just to give a sneak peek. Yes, and that's it. So let me just compare both of them together. And sorry, is my VS code, is it large enough or should I make it larger? Okay, okay, yeah. So basically all of this, having to write the table elements over and over again, we created a dynamic component where we just pass in data, probably a title based on the use case of the table that is required, a couple of settings just so that you can give the table some alignment to give it extra functionality. And then that's all, basically. So for every developer that who wants to create a table now, you just go ahead and call this component and pass in the settings data, and that's it. So just a brief function on how we were able to achieve this. Firstly, the first thing that we needed to do was find a way to abstract all these things. We look at the things that are static and the things that change over time. So if we look at this particular table element now, these are the table, these TH elements are the things that tend to change over time because based on the table, the headers are obviously going to be different. Another thing that we also saw that was changing obviously was the data. So we need to find the way to pass in things like the header elements here, the data. And then in cases where we had buttons too, we had to be able to pass in the function that this button was going to fire into that component. So these were the things that we had in mind when we we're trying to do it. And let's not forget things like pipes here too. We have a pipe here, currency pipe. So we wouldn't want to say because we want to create a dynamic component, take away the fact that developers can use pipes away from them. That would be a very bad thing to do. So we had to look at ways to abstract this and make them customizable. And that's what I'm here to share with you guys today. So um, here is the component itself that was created. Yes. So if you can see very well, this is the template markup. As we saw earlier, we're passing in four different inputs into that component. The title, depending on the use case. The record, record represents the data. So in our own case, it was probably the customers, the list, an array of customers. Then settings, I mentioned settings earlier to, do, to be able to give like table a configuration setting. So basically this is what our settings looks like. It's of type column map settings. And then basically for every setting, for every row, we are saying we want a primary key, a header, and a format. So in our template here, if we look at it closely, we can see that the header for every setting you are passing in represents what you want to show on the TH for that particular row. So that means we have been able to cover that. Then the primary key here represents what you want the record to be binded to for that particular cell. So if you look at the table here, we have full name here. We know that for this particular customer in that array, there's probably a property name that is binded to this particular email here. So we are trying to say that the primary key is what we are passing into this table component here. And then for format, format represents 
the case where I said we needed pipes. You don't want to have a situation where developers no longer have access to pipes because you are using dynamic components. So we needed to find a way to give developers access to those pipes. So if you look through our HTML elements, we see that we are passing the header for the TH elements. We have, so here is a particular use case here, like I was mentioning, is a specific use case. So in our case here, we have something called, but we have buttons here, but we needed to also have situations where we can cater for multiple buttons. So if we have multiple buttons in this case, that means this will have to change to a plural, so actions instead of action. So basically we're able to just do this by saying, okay, if you pass in a list of buttons and we'll still come back to what the buttons look like, based on whether or not the buttons, you have more than one button in your array or not, show actions or actions, and this is basically what this is representing. Here. And if you don't even pass in a button at all, you are still covered, it would show just the particular, um, it wouldn't even show anything at all. So you're good to go. You won't have a, anything shown in that place. So moving forward here, we are looking through each individual record. So for each NG4 cycle that we have here, we have access to a particular customer object in this array here. So basically what we now do here is that we loop through the settings that you gave us that was imputed. So in this case, we are looking through the settings for that particular field. And then we have access to each individual primary key header and format for that particular cell. And then for each one, we're just saying, show us the record's primary key. So the primary key of that particular record. So in this case, for the first one here, let me just open up the sample data here so that we can follow along. So yeah, yeah. So let's say for this particular customer here, this is the customer. And this is what the settings looks like. So we are saying the primary key is name and the header is full name. So basically what we are saying is for this guy here, the header is going to be this because that was what we mentioned. And we to look at that customer object and point to the value of what is name. And if you look at the data here, That is what, sorry, I mean, email, sorry. This is actually email. Email is the first thing showing here. Apologies, I think I must have missed that up. So email is going to post to the particular data it is and then render that on the screen. And that was how we we're able to do that. So another important aspect here is um, that came to play was being able to use the pipes, like I mentioned. So the pipes were very important. It's a very important part because we have different types of pipes. We have the currency pipe, we have the date pipe, we have the, percentage pipe based on what we wanted to do. So we needed a way to actually make the developers free to be able to pick whatever pipe they wanted. So in order to do this, what we needed to do was to create a super pipe. And it's just a nomenclature, it's not actually an official name. But basically, here it is. We created a super pipe that takes in a pipe format. It takes in the particular value you're trying to pipe and then an optional value of the pipe format. So if you look into the template here, you can see that we have a format cell pipe, the pipe that we're calling, and then map that format. So basically, we are saying on the column settings, there's an optional field called the format. I want to be able to pass that into the data. So for this particular example here, let me just open up data close by so that we can go through it. So for this particular setting here, we want a pipe format of uh, currency. So for the total spent, we want to say, okay, take that pipe and convert it to a pipe of currency. So basically what our format pipe does is it has access to the value and then it has access to the format. So we are saying of type currency. And if you look at pipe format again, there's an extra thing here. We are using something called um, an enum. So basically we have a list of pipes that we've already created inside our format pipe. So based on whatever was imputed, we then know, okay, which pipe you are trying to relate to. So basically, if you say you want a date pipe of currency like we have here, you are saying pipe current or currency. So you are pointing to one. That's how enums work. So for each individual thing you have on the list, zero, one, two, three, and so on. And I think you also have the optional, um, you can pass in an argument to make it start from one actually. And I think that's possible. But in this case, we left it as the default. So in this case here, pipe format of currency represents one. And in our pipe format, we have a conditional statement here that says, if the format is one, return this the currency pipe, the transform value code. So basically what we are doing is we are referencing 
you are actually piping that value from the template. So basically you can also use pipes from inside the components file. You all, all you just have to do is import it from Angular core, and then you have access to the pipe, and then you can do whatever transforms you want. So here we have for dates, if it's of type two, which is of type dates, we have it by a date pipe here that is already in. And if it's of percentage, we have a date pipe that is already in. So basically that's how we are able to be able to dynamically pass in pipes into that component and then let it do whatever it wants to do. So um, another interesting part here was the buttons, like I mentioned. For each individual row, if you pass in a button settings, it's going to populate the settings onto the TD. So if you look at this here, you can see that because we passed in a particular button setting, we already have, okay, and this is actually the static. Let me show you actually what we have now. So this is we using the dynamic component itself. We have this here, the buttons on the left, on the right. So this is where we pass in the buttons. So this is the customer setting and this is the button. So we are passing in a single button. And for the button, our button is of type button settings and it has the title property, a function property, and then optional properties based on whether or not you want to format the buttons with CSS or not. And then params. Basically what params means is that what are the arguments that you want to be available inside that function? So here for this example, we have a title of open. We are passing a couple of parameters that I want to have access to, to be able to mod make, perform some actions on them. And then the particular function that we want to fire when that button is clicked dynamically. So basically anytime a developer wants to create a table and wants to add a button functionality from the get go, you can just set up the parameters you want to have access to. And then because you've already specified these parameters here, you can go ahead and create your function from this part here and then do whatever logic you want and have access to those arguments and be sure that you're going to have access to them inside that component. So here is how we are using it inside the component that was created. So this ng4 is just in case you have more than one button and then we can actually show that, render that on the screen. And then we are calling a function that's already been created in that component. And this is what the function looks like. So basically what the function just does is it takes in that particular record, it takes in the function that you passed in from the button. And then it takes in the values. These are, those are the parameters that you passed in, if you can remember. So these parameters here, so it has access to them. And basically what we're doing is that we are spreading, we are calling your function and then we are spreading the arguments that you created. So if you look closely at the parameters here, these are the parameters that you specified you want in your function. But then you also have to list them here as arguments in your function so that you can use them in your function. So in order to have access to these arguments here, based on these names that you have passed in, I, it is also important to know that the order actually matters so that you don't get the wrong property in the wrong place. We are now having access to these properties here. And then all we just do is that since it's an array, we just spread it and give you the values and then you have access to it automatically. So with that, because you already have access to these values now, the functionality we have here is just to show an alert that just shows the customer name, the total spent on the phone. I click on open, it just shows you the customer name for that particular row. If you click on another row, it shows you that, and then you're good to go, you're passing the buttons. Yeah, so another thing we would notice here is that um, on the static table, for the total spent, um, we are passing in, if you look at the data here, we are passing in true, true or false values here. But if we look at the UI, we have access to yes or no. So basically you also want the, a situation where people, if you are writing your table cost uh, component yourself, you should be able to make modifications in your template, you know, use your template binding and probably based on a false value through different types of text and stuff. So we wanted them to also not lose that functionality. And we felt the best way to do it is that you create a directive. So basically every logic that you have that is custom to a particular field would then be implemented inside that directive. And this is where the directive is actually instantiated here on the templates. So we have an, a directive called app cell style. 
and then we are passing in the record primary key and the column key. So basically, we are passing in the data, the value itself, and then the key mapping that was sent. And so for example, you have the particular email, wherever the email of that user is in this field. And then here you have the value email to represent that particular property. And here it's what the directive looks like. So we have a particular use case here in our directive. So because we have access to the key and the value, we can then make that particular decision and say, okay, if this particular loyalty reward is true, I want you to change the color to a green color and then change it to yes. And then based on that, that's what will be rendered on the screen here. And then, yeah, we have a dynamic component. So basically that's just the note down how we're able to modify. So instead of having to everyone create, you know, CD elements, table elements in different particular parts of the application, they have a standard that follows the design. So everyone has the same table and no one is creating something extra. We also made modifications, like you can see on the models here, to add custom CSS classes so that you don't have to say, because you want to create styles, you make different modifications. And that was how we were able to actually create that. So the second dynamic components, sorry, and if, in case there are any questions, please just let me know so that I can, yeah. Do we have any questions for him here or are we ready for him to continue on? Okay, if you have any, go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll let him continue. Okay, so the second cool component, uh, dynamic component we're able to create was uh, the modal component. So basically we wanted a situation where we had a single component that represented all the kind of models that we had. So in this case here, if I show a demo, so we have a model that slides in from the right. And we wanted it to be a situation where regardless of where who wanted to use the model, you just need to inject your contents. I think something close to what Val already showed today, but we wanted it to be a case where one model component will be able to serve everybody. So this is the same component is the one because of the type of, uh, Model component that we are specifying, you see that the particular model has changed. And there's actually a difference between this and the primary. This is more of a confirmation is it true or false kind of thing? And this primary is more of probably want to show a form inside a pop up, that kind of thing. And that's what this primary represents. So let's just take a look at what that looks like here in the code. Yeah. So uh, I think so that I don't spoil it. This is what this is how it's actually instantiated basically. So the buttons you saw, these are the buttons, and then we just have a single component that caters for all three use cases, and that was it. So depending on the kind of model that the developer wanted to use, he would specify a type here. So in this case here, let me open the component so that we can see what that is. Side. Yes. So here we have a type of confirmation, but that's actually being changed here. So based on the button that is clicked, we're saying the model data type should be the one from the right or whether it should be the one of type primary or whether it should be a confirmation model. Regardless of you being able to just change the type too, you're also in control of the content that is being shown inside. So if we take a look at it again from the right side, hello world, dynamic model in action, injected content. You have access to it here. So we can see the header, that the one that is specifying it as an input, the dynamic component in action, and then the button text too. As far as the button text, you had one in charge of this particular button text there. And on the, on the case of the button, we also still have a validation status on it. So basically you can switch between validation status as you see fit based on the use case you're trying to implement. So in this case here, we have a button disabled and that button disabled is saying, okay, the button should be valid on the first state. But based on whatever output is sent back, you can then know whether or not you want to change the state of the button. So in this case here now, we have a submit button. If I change this to valid, And I open it, and we see that we have access to the button and then it's clickable. And then because of the way the, bot 
um, the component was created, we already have an event emitter so that whenever this button is clicked, we have access to it on the outside. So if I check into console now, I see, so for every time this is clicked, yeah, you can see that we have access to it. And I think we have access to the console too. That's how we're able to close it. So that was an interesting part. And um, yeah, so another interesting part is it's a pop-up. You cannot be in total control. You still want to give them the leverage to be able to add custom things into it. And that's where content projection came in. So something similar to what Val showed earlier, but in this case, we are not actually specifying heads or class. We just see whatever content you pass in, because since you already have the header as an input and you have the subheader, the main thing is probably left is probably the content that you want. And then we just render that in the middle. So this is what it looks like inside the dynamic component itself. So basically the model type is what determines what the model will look like. And basically me switching between those model types that I see was just purely CSS. So I'm saying instead of the model to show in the center, show from the right, and that's just the CSS type. And if I open the CSS component, you will see what I'm talking about. So there's a type of primary, there's a type of confirmation, and that's it. So you changing the model type, all it does, does is it changes the CSS um, class, and then that changes what the view, the kind of view that you see. Well, so here we are setting the header that you passed in as an input subheader and then the ng content here is why i said injected content so in this arc in our example here this is what we are passing as our injected content yeah injected content additional model content goes here and if you click on this then you can see that that's what shows up here so for everything we add here we add another s3 let's say uh, let's say it's angular Yeah, and then we have that there. So anyone can actually inject, depending on the kind of model you have. I think here too. So you see it shows up here. I should show the confirmation too. You are in charge of whatever content shows up here. Yeah. So, and I think I already explained what the submit, we already have access to the submits, the council, and basically these are the things that control whether the event emitters, and let me just show that here in the TypeScript file. So yeah, we have the event emitters here. And then based on whether, when it is clicked, we're just emitting. So if this is clicked, we emit an event to the parent component. And when council is also clicked, we emit an event to the component. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. I hope it was interesting. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Oye. That was great. Does anybody have any questions? Art had said at one point that this is excellent. I don't know if you mm -hmm. noticed that, but he did make a comment. Excellent. I definitely know that. that. That was amazing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so um, I'll probably actually just drop a link to the GitHub repo so so that I can have people can have a closer look and then yeah get access and then. Okay, great. Thank you. I was just going to ask you. Give me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So thank you. Thank you. That would, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was I, again like both talks really great i think also really clear um and i like like the steps that you took um in each each one and like it built off each other itself um so i think that's that's always really helpful especially uh for for zoom talks thank you very much <laughs> that was also wait another beat just in case there's any people that have questions again if you feel free to type in the chat or or unmute All right, cool. Um, well then, thank you so much, both of you. Um, I'm gonna stop our recording.